Welcome to the Smart Connector podcast, which helps entrepreneurs generate more impact, wealth and success, attract others for all the right reasons and become a smart connector, the architect of your amazing business and life. This podcast is sponsored by Virtual Non-Execs, the world's number one peer-to-peer board advisor community, which connects thousands of investors, entrepreneurs and advisors globally. Welcome to the Smart Connector podcast. As ever, I have a wonderful guest. Welcome, Angela Johnson. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So Angela has over 25 years experience of helping people and organizations work together more efficiently, enjoyably and productively. And she calls herself a professional people geek. And we're going to get into what exactly what that means and why she feels qualified to make such a bold claim a little bit later on. So Angela's one of the world's leading experts on Scrum, and this is a framework used in product development and project management to deliver exceptional value to an organization and its customers. And she's also the author of Scrum Master Files, which is a book. And Angela, would you like to hold it up? I'm okay. really happy to. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And that contains the secrets every Scrum Master Coach should know. So you're probably thinking, maybe scratching your head and thinking, well, what exactly is Scrum? So we will get into that, obviously, very quickly. But first of all, Angela, tell us a little bit more about you and your business. Thank you. I started my business 13 years ago, a bit of a broken corporate employee. I was working as a scrum master, working as a coach for other people, but I really wanted to do that on my own. And so started my company and got busy. So I started attracting like-minded individuals. And here I am 13 years later with a team. We also have a brick and mortar uh, training and event center just outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota. So we hold our events in the center, but we also license and rent the space out to other companies. And so many have let their own buildings go, but they still need to meet in person once in a while. Yes. Yes. Amazing. Okay. So let's just get into it, Angela. What exactly is this thing called Scrum? If you ask my 11-year-old son, he would say it's just working together to get something done. Okay. And the metaphor, scrum is, you know, short for scrummage. If you're familiar with the game of rugby, the formation where people, you know, band together is called a scrummage and yeah. they're trying to get the ball headed to a common goal. Mm. And so that rugby like approach was quoted in a 1986 Harvard Business Review article. And the professors who wrote that article were talking about how companies were working so much more efficiently than their competition by the sheer act of these people, regardless of role, getting together and getting something done for the good of the customer. And the two gentlemen who created Scrum into a framework loved that metaphor. So that's where the metaphor of rugby-like approach, Scrum, so hence the name. It's not an acronym, which is a common misunderstanding, but it's just short for scrummage. Yeah, I love that idea and that metaphor of coming together for the good of the customer, because we all know that customers are the lifeblood of any organization, right? Absolutely. Obviously, every organization has customers, right? Every, everyone. So why is it so valuable? What has kind of made it this leading framework? For me, it's the ability to fail fast. You work in smaller time boxes as opposed to months and months without getting any sort of transparency or visibility into what's really happening until, whoopsie, at the end, we found out that we missed something or missed a test or have a defect or something. So those smaller time boxes, those smaller chunks of work enable radical transparency so an organization can pivot faster. It's Mm -hmm. not always bad news, right? It's not always, you know, oh, we missed something. Sometimes it's good news. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's, oh, we got that done so much faster. Get it in the hands of the customer. Why wait? Yeah, well, I totally understand that because really, if you're focusing on the customer and their needs, the closer 
you can be to having an understanding of those needs and having that feedback and a dialogue, obviously, the better your product is going to be, right? Absolutely. And and I've had so many horror stories just from my own experience as a traditional or classic project manager where, you know, 12 months had gone by or 18 months had gone by and we finally deliver something and a client would say, oh, our needs have changed. We don't even need it now. Or, oh, you missed the whole point. What? We've wasted six months. What if we could have talked sooner? Yeah. That's very interesting. So does it work for, say, internal products or projects as well as customer facing ones? Absolutely. There are a number of our students or clients who will say, okay, this is great for the external customers who pay us money, but internally we have just operational things that we need to do, Mm -hmm. even if they're projects. And the shorter time boxes and the higher transparency will oftentimes help them deliver those things sooner than a traditional life cycle or a classic project life cycle. Yeah. So so if I can just like break apart this thing about time boxes, what exactly is a time box? It sounds fascinating, but what is it? The classic definition of project is that it has a start and an end. And mm. so in Scrum, we have these smaller, and we do call them time boxes. The proper name is Sprint, uh, oh. which confuses some people. So I do prefer time box, but there is a start and an end. So if we work in a two-week sprint, now we've got this 10 business day, two-week time box to be able to get something done or to learn more so that we can figure out what the next thing is rather than months and months. So in Scrum, they look at time boxes of 30 days or less. Mm. The shorter, the better. And Mm. the questions I always ask my clients are, how often does your world change? How often are you looking for feedback? How many chances do you want to improve? Mm. Because every sprint is an opportunity for us to adapt. And so in a 52-week year, if we do one-week sprints, like my organization does, we see that as 52 pivot points, 52 opportunities to adapt, Mm. 52 opportunities to improve, as opposed to two weeks, which would give you 26. Yes, Okay. So, I mean, if you're a a small business owner and you want to adopt this, call it a framework, right? Mm -hmm. So let's look at some kind of concrete and tangible examples of what one of these time boxes or these sprints would actually look like. Can you give us an example, Angela? Absolutely. Regardless of the country that uh, a student or a client is in, I tend to ask people to shy away from Mondays and Fridays Mm. You know, people will take a Friday off to give themselves a nice long weekend or stuff happens over the weekend and Mondays you wind up, oh, somebody didn't come in or they're sick. So a better practice is to start and stop these time boxes on like a Tuesday or a Wednesday when you have a higher probability of having people at work. And so if we start our sprints, our time boxes Wednesday morning and we're doing a two week sprint, that means every other Wednesday we're starting a new segment. We're starting fresh. So we can talk about what happened in the last sprint. We can talk about what happened and did things go well? Did they not go so well? But now we can adapt what we're going to do in this new sprint. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I mean, I must admit, I've never used this methodology. I've never been in organizations that use it, but I love the concept. So if you're somebody that's working by yourself, say with a little outsource team, and maybe you outsource uh, projects rather than continually working with employees, for example, is Agile and Scrum still applicable? It can be. The one thing that we can never control is how a third party does their job, right? You mentioned outsourcing. And so when you're coming up with your contract, or your statement of work, or whatever we like to call that, we may just use plain language to say, you know, how fast outsourcer, implementer, do you turn deliverables around? Because my needs change every 10 business days or every 15 business days. Mm -hmm. Is it reasonable for us to put into our agreement with each other that you're going to turn around deliverables to me every 15 days or every 10 days, and then let the conversation happen from there? Because at the end of the day, Even if you're interested in 
more transparency or more opportunities to pivot, we can't really control that third party except for what it says in our contract. Mm. So we can have the conversation and then make sure that our expectations are captured and that we're getting those needs so that we can be as agile, right? As adaptable, as nimble as we possibly can, Mm. even if we're using a third party, even if we're outsourcing. Yeah. So, I mean, how does this framework boost productivity and morale? You know, is it, is the measurable results, tangible results from using it? I'm sure that actually is. There are, absolutely. What's so contextual about a company, though, is what it already measures. You know, the metrics at a bank, for example, are never going to look the same as metrics at my little services company. Mm. And so a benefit just from the people doing the work, and I can use my own team as an example, is transparency, but it's also helping each other learn so that you're never single-threaded. Oh, that's only Angela can do that. Well, Angela's not here today. Oh, well, then here we are. We're stuck. No, we'd rather have people learn from each other so that if Angela isn't here and she was working on something, Hmm. but a team member sees it and they know exactly where I left off, they can pick up the ball and run with it. They can finish it. And so Hmm. our team calls it making work visible, big and visible. We, we tend to refer to it as dark work when, you know, work isn't up on the board and clearly visible for anybody to jump in and help finish. Yeah, that's very interesting. I like that idea and I can see how helpful it is really because, of course, over-reliance on a single individual is never a good thing, is it? Because we humans, we're not machines. No. We, can, we can fall under a bus. We can have a family crisis or anything can happen, really. We can have a bad day and really do the job badly. That's the thing about humans. We are fallible. So I can see that by creating a system that lightens the load of one person and actually gives the opportunity to sort of, you know, pass the baton, let's just say, to somebody else. It It is a little bit like sports, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. uh, very much to do with teamwork and how people function as a group rather than just on their own. Absolutely. And I know many of your listeners are small business owners. And mm-hmm. one of the things I talk to any business leader or owner about is risk. You know, so if I'm in a conversation with them and I hear too many um, instances of them naming one individual, only this person knows how to do something. Only that person I'll say, how do you feel about risk? They never say they like it. They always say, oh, we work to mitigate risk. And I say, well, I respectfully disagree because I heard several instances where you name one person. I prefer to go positive with what could happen to that person. You know, what if they win the lottery tomorrow? You know, what if they call in rich and just don't come back? What would we do? And it always catches these leaders just flat footed. They're like, well, well, we'd figure it out. Why wait? (laughs) Why wait until we're in that position? (laughs) Why not let teams figure it out all the time. And now we're getting that knowledge sharing and that knowledge transfer, not just lightening the load, as you mentioned, but also people learning other things and learning new skills. Yeah, yeah, it does. That does make a lot of sense. And of course, with small businesses in particular, it's often the owner, isn't it? That's the principal bottleneck. We all know that, don't we? Mm-hmm. We, yeah. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we entrepreneurs, we don't like to let go of our babies, really, do we? No, and I'm a big believer in not being this team's bottleneck. And when we have others visit the space, they're like, they'll see me, you know, literally loading the dishwasher or doing something in the event center. And they're like, why are you doing that? I just work here. I have the dream team. You know, they make the magic happen. I never want them to be like, oh, you have to wait for Angela. Oh, Angela has to sign off on that. Oh, Angela, this or that. Mm -mm." It may be radical for some of your listeners. However, my team all has access to a stamp with my signature on it. They literally are empowered. You know, if they need to sign something, we have, everybody has a company credit card and that strikes fear in the hearts of other business owners. But in the 13 years that I've been working this way, nobody has abused it. 
Not once. Really? I have not one instance of anybody abusing such things. If you really empower people or start treating people like adults, you know, and you create the environment that fosters this empowerment and self-management, amazing things can happen. But when I think organizations are run from a place of fear, that's mm-hmm. where you get some of that command and control and worry. Yeah, command and control. Well, that that's right, because really, it's just bad management, isn't it, in mm-hmm. a way? And, and also, of course, the thing about over-reliance on specific individuals is that you're not really building value in the business, are you? Mm-mm. No, not at all. And I never want somebody to say to a customer or a potential customer even, no, we can't do that. I really want this thought process and this team, we'll figure it out. Like, you know, So we have this little mantra about just saying yes to the business for the event space, and then we'll figure it out. And so we've had to adapt for all kinds of sizes. At some point, we're not the event venue for, say, uh, 250,000 you know, attendees at a global convention. No, but we have 8,000 square feet. So we can do you know, 150 or less. So we're small business events. But any request from a business event perspective, this team is empowered to figure things out. Yeah. And I'm sure that I'm sure they feel pretty happy about that. People around here tend to be happy and they stay around. We were just talking about one of my team members has been here nine years out Mm. of the 13. Yeah, well, I mean, people do not stay in an organization, particularly during this era of the great resignation, which we all know about, Mm -hmm. unless they really are happy because, you know, a lot of people are deserting the world of work to become entrepreneurs. And as a result, good employees have choices, right? Yes, they do. Absolutely. So it helps with employee retention. It does. And happier employees, like you say, are going to stay. And one of the things, if you look at some of the research out there, Daniel Pink is kind of the popular one Mm -hmm. who writes in his book, Drive, about what motivates people. Mm -hmm. And he talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose Mm -hmm. being what really motivates. Well, when I look at the Scrum framework, autonomy, teams are self-managing in Scrum. A leader or a manager can say, here's what I want. We call them the product owner in Scrum. Here's what needs to happen. Mm. But then the team is empowered to come up with the how. The team is empowered to come up with the solution. And so that aligns nicely with the research behind what motivates people, what keeps people wanting to come to work and Mm -hmm. mastery, getting better. So in Scrum, at the end of every one of our time boxes, we have what we call a retrospective. Mm -hmm. which is an opportunity for the team to reflect on how things go. And do we have any ideas for the next time box, for the next sprint that we can immediately put into place so that we can take advantage of that improvement rather than wait? Yeah, I love that. It makes it almost uh, sound like fun. (laughs) Right? Work does not have to suck. Work work can be fun. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. So let's talk about it from the point of view of customers, because that's where we started, isn't it, Angela? Mm -hmm. How does a customer, would they be aware that this is going on in the background? Or is it just just that it, it improves product market fit, for example? The the latter, the last thing that you said, because oftentimes we'll even say if a company or a student gets all hung up on the framework and they'll be like, well, we're not doing it right. We're doing it wrong. Those are not helpful words. Mm -hmm. I'm like, do your customers care that the way that you do work is called Scrum or that is one of the popular agile methods? No. All your customer cares about is did I get what I wanted? Did I not get what I wanted? And so we try to talk to organizations about putting the focus on delighting that customer. That's really your goal. Your goal is to keep that customer happy. Because as we know, in this day and age of, you mentioned the great resignation, but it's also social media, you know, so if a customer isn't happy, it's not bad enough that they leave. (laughs) They go on social media and badmouth you to everybody. So we want to keep the customer happy. Scrum is a way to do that. Yeah. And of course, it, it it all, everything links, doesn't it? So if the customer's happy, 
The, the employees are happy. I think it was Richard Branson. He said, I can't remember the exact quote, but he said, put your employees ahead of your customers. Why did he say that? Because if your employees are happy, your customers will pick up mm -hmm. on that or on that commitment and that dedication to you. And that, of course, is where your reputation comes from, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. they, those people are then going to go out into the world and they are going to be singing your praises and they're going to be going that extra mile and they're going to be delivering, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, so Angela, tell us, how do people actually typically work then with this framework today? What's the actual process? A number of organizations will start by sending individuals to some sort of training class. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, the credential that I hold as a certified scrum trainer, I'm one of about 250 people on the planet that can deliver the certified scrum master credential, which is, I liken it to a bit of a driver's license. Mm -hmm. Some people think, well, credentials show that you've spent years and years doing something and achieved it. Well, the certified scrum master is a low barrier to entry because we can't change the way the world's doing work unless we get people yeah. helping us. And so individuals will come to a training class for sure. But my team focuses on the leadership when we engage in a private client, because it's one thing if the leader just kind of reads an article you know, in Gartner or they go to a conference and then mm. it's seen as the flavor of the month, right? We're going to use Scrum or we're going to try Agile and people don't know what that means. So no. we prefer to start with the leaders. If the leader doesn't understand the kind of changes Scrum requires in the organization, it's not going to be effective if they yeah. just use all the vocabulary. Yeah, makes sense. The last leadership workshop we did, as we were getting to the end and talking about next steps, I flat out asked. I, I kept hearing, well, they're not doing this. The people aren't doing that. They really don't understand Scrum. You're going to have to retrain them. I'm like, well, what expectations did you give people as their boss about what's going to change in their job? What stays the same with their job? Did you give them any? And they all just stared at me and I said, I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> and now we're, now why are we, we wondering that these people are confused and they don't know how to behave? So our follow-up is we're going to do just that. We're going to spend more time with the leaders to help them craft their message about why are we making this change? What does it mean for your job? Because people will freak out a little bit too if they don't know. You know, they'll tell themselves a story in their head that may not be true about this change. So a better practice is to start with the leaders. Yes. Do I see people sending individuals to classes? Absolutely. And I can plant seeds and I can get somebody excited, but we can't make real organizational change unless we mm. get to the leaders. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So leaders will often, they will resist structure, won't they? Because, you know, classic kind of leaders, they're visionaries, aren't they? They're people that, you know, the big picture thinkers, aren't they? Do you find that, that they're not necessarily going to be using the frameworks themselves? They just have to understand the purpose of it? Or do you find that it is necessary for them to uh, actually adopt these frameworks themselves? There's little benefit in the leader, you know, adopting the framework per se, but there's lots of value in them understanding exactly what you said about mm -hmm. if we don't make these changes, what could happen? And yeah. where I tend to see real change happen is when we get a CEO, CIO, COO, fill in the mm -hmm. blank, right? C-suite yeah. leader involved. And then you get the team involved. Usually it's the middle. Usually it's the, the middle that digs their heels in and wonders, yeah. what does it mean for me? I, I, I see in smaller companies, and I would define a small company as maybe 5,000 employees or less. And if they are privately held, we see a lot of success when we get the senior leaders on board, because then they just say, we're doing this. Whereas if you get a publicly traded company and they're huge, like mm -hmm. there's some in the U.S. that are like 20, 30,000 employees and they're global 
now, mm. working with teams in other continents. Yeah. And so if those are publicly traded companies, oftentimes the C-level isn't even empowered because they have to answer to a board of directors. Yep. Or shareholders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then sometimes you just spin your wheels a little bit because even if they are on board, somebody else may not. So it may not be. Yeah, that's really interesting. So there's a certain sort of size of company where this where this framework has the most impact. In my experience, and I've been doing this kind of work for 18 years, 13 years with Collaborative Leadership Team, the company I founded, but yeah. I've been doing this work for 18 years. And over that time, that's kind of the trend I've seen is yeah. smaller privately held companies are yeah. able to reap the benefits more quickly than yeah. the larger, you know, monolithic publicly traded companies can. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose the difference is often the C-suite in those smaller companies are often the founders of the business. Mm -hmm. Whereas obviously with these publicly listed companies, they're often basically kind of professional CEOs, professional kind of, you know, CIO, they're often brought in because they have that uh, experience across the board, right? But they're not necessarily, they haven't really b given birth to the business, as it were. Right. And I do see a lot of turnover. You know, yeah. like the average tenure of a chief information officer in the U.S. that I've noticed is somewhere between three and five years. And they all seem to have kind of their own playbook when they come in and want to make changes. And then you just start getting traction and they're gone. And here comes the yeah. next one. Yeah, you know, I hear this a lot from my clients because I work with a lot of consultants, for example. I do have a lot of consultancy clients. And they often say that they really prefer working with those kind of small to mid-sized businesses just simply because for all the reasons that you've described, it's just much easier to kind of gain traction, make an impact and actually get results. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so these businesses that you're talking about, uh, are they in any particular industry vertical, for example, or is Scrum and is it applicable across the board to lots and lots of different types of industries? Uh, one of the questions we get, is this about software development? And the answer is no, it's about product development. And mm. so any organization that has products, your service could be your product. And so it'll work in any environment where we need to pivot faster, that we need to solve a complex or a complicated problem. Mm -hmm. Do people use it in an environment where the problem to be solved is simple? Maybe, but people use project management in all kinds of environments too, regardless yeah. of whether it's simple or complex or complicated. And so I always offer to people that it's a choice. It's just a choice on the menu for ways you could do work. And it's not limited to software development, but it became popular. Mm -hmm. in the software industry. And so the software industry tends to be early adopters. So yeah. kind of that, you know, mid 1990s, late 1990s and early 2000s, those were kind of the only companies or departments that were taking mm. advantage of this. Yeah. Today, I have so many different clients that are using Scrum. I have mm. services businesses, which excites me because I am a services, you know, business. And so I've helped some consultancies implement this. We have school teachers using some of the elements from the framework to run their classrooms and to get the teams of kids to work in a more self-organizing, autonomous yeah. way. Okay. We have a couple of clients who buy rundown properties. In the U.S., we call it flipping, right? Flipping a house. Yeah, we call it flipping. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we have people flipping houses using mm. Scrum. So okay. there's all kinds of industries that are adopting this. But I, it's been around, you know, 30 years. 1993 was the first Scrum yeah. team. So Yeah. So it can be used across the board, really, is, is what you're saying. Where there's a team, where there's a need, where there's a customer, there is a place for this. Absolutely. The yeah. environments that I don't see it work well in are things that are a little bit more volatile, like a call center. You know, you can't predict whether the phone's going to ring or that, you know, an email is going to come in. So people will try to implement it in an environment like that and then say, this isn't working. Well, wait a minute. What problem were you trying to solve? 
well, we were just told to use Scrum. Well, that's silly because, you know, you don't really have a deliverable. Like I said, you don't know if the phone's going to ring or when an email is going to come in. Or we had a team in a human resource department that was trying to get more candidates through their pipeline, through their hiring process. And they Mm -hmm. said, Scrum is not helping at all. Well, of course, it's not going to help for that. You know, they really just needed to flow candidates through an existing system. And there's plenty of other ways of working like Kanban or things like that are more applicable. So sometimes people meet someone like me and they'll say, well, you know, does Scrum work for everything? Well, of course not. But let's talk about what your goals and objectives are. Yeah. Let's talk about your customers. Let's talk about what problem you're trying to solve. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So Angela, in your book, you, well, we were talking about it before we came on air, weren't we? And you were saying that it's a guide really that is based around some of your own trial and error moments Mm -hmm. and that you've put a lot of your personal lessons into that book. So I'd love to hear a couple of examples of where it perhaps it went wrong and the lessons that you learned as a result. Absolutely. One of the things I believe as human beings, we put pressure on ourselves to get things right or perfect. And there is no such thing. You know, most Mm. of us learn from our failures. I just refer to the word fail as first attempt in learning. And so the aha moments I had about Scrum really came from some of those. For example, I came out of classic project management. And oftentimes when you're running out of time and you're running out of money at the end, we try to get people to pull all nighters or, you know, stay the weekend. And (laughs) right. And people never like that. Yeah. And so if they do it, what do they get rewarded with? Do it again on the next project, you know? Yeah, that's right. You pulled it off that you pulled it off then. You can pull it off again. So we kind of have rewarded these heroes, I like to call them. Well, so my first Scrum team ever was actually pretty mature. I was the person, you know, as the Scrum master who didn't have as much experience as a couple of the the team members. And so there was this one gentleman who I just was observing really helping people out and teaching skills, running tests. It was a software environment. So he was just kind of doing whatever he needed to do to make the team successful. Well, I kept calling him a rock star. I kept referring to him openly as a rock star. And he pulls me aside at the end of one of our very first sprints. I'll never forget it. And we, he and I were talking one-on-one and he said, could you please stop it? <laughs> and I said, but I'm giving you a compliment. And he said, this is a team. There is no room for individuals and you're singling me out. And I don't want people to think that's me Uh trying to be the rock star, trying to show them up. I'm sincerely one of the team. And it was just one of those, oh oh my God, Angela, you idiot. (laughs) You know, but I was just falling back on my old project management habits. It didn't even occur to me that here I was very subtly undermining the very concept of we, mm-hmm. not me, because mm-hmm. I was in individually singling one person out. So that one really stuck with me. Oh, yes, I can imagine. And in a way, perhaps, you know, somebody, if they've got an important position, a lot of people, they want to recognize that because people in important positions, they often like to get have their ego stroke, don't they? Mm-hmm. So, you know, particularly if you're serving them, then we are you know, we are prone perhaps to compliment, flatter or whatever, single them out. But so I can understand why perhaps you did that. But I can also understand why he said that. That's it's amazing the- that you used the word ego. You can't see the back of my T-shirt, but it says your ego is not your amigo. <laughs> ah, really? Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, so tell us about another example, Angela, from the book. Very similar to what you just described about somebody's ego needing to be stroked or them, you know, kind of wrapping up their whole identity in their job title or the position. Because we talk about how a scrum team ideally is flat. It's ideally no hierarchy so that we are interested in helping each other out. And there was this one person who, unbeknownst to me, had been promised a promotion if they joined the scrum team and then made it happen made the the team successful and so on. So I didn't know at the time, 
but behaviorally, that person was not willing to help anybody else out. They were really clinging to their traditional job title that had the word senior tapped uh, in front of it. Uh -huh. And so every sprint, they would be like, mm, no, I'm not going to pick up that work. I'm a senior developer. I don't do that kind of work and just really not engaging at all. And so when I had a one-on-one -on -one with this person, I you know, had exhausted all of my attempts for them to work together. I flat out asked, are you just confused about this new way of working? Are you telling me you don't want to? And they said, I don't want to. I was promised the next promotion, so I'm just biding my time until this thing is done. So as a new scrum master, I had to find that person's oh, yeah. manager mm. and say, so sorry. <laughs> Here's all the things I've tried. Here's all the things the team has tried. But they've literally voted this person off the island. Like they are pretending that this person is not here. So as their boss, it is now your problem. That's, you know, where my involvement ended. But it was very awkward. It was one of the first times I learned to really, you know, try, but let that person save face, which is why I wound up having the conversation one-on-one -on -one after we had mm -hmm. tried and then gave them the benefit of the doubt. You know, are you confused? Do you just not know what to do in this new way of working? Or are you just not wanting to? And I will say this, they respected me enough, at least to be honest with me. They yeah. Could have, they could have, you know, phoned it in for the remainder of the project, but they didn't. They said, nope, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> now I need yeah. to <laughs> yeah. get this taken care of. Yeah. You know, that's a really interesting example because I remember from my time working in organizations, which I did for a very long time, is that people tend to, this whole thing about the toxic workplace culture and people playing at politics, that tends to happen when people are uncertain, doesn't it? It does. Uh, and so when people are scared, and I think this example that you just gave of that guy that he'd, he'd got something that made him feel a bit safer, which was the title of senior something. Mm -hmm. And that and so that gave him a sense of certainty. And he felt threatened that he was going to uh, lose that. And that somehow by helping all these other people to rise, it's a bit like the rising tide and the little rock that comes out and all of a sudden the rock's going to disappear underneath the water. I think that was his that must have been what he was thinking. But as you said, with the with those organizations, you can't come in and tell them this is what's going on and I can fix it because it is a cultural, it's a fundamental cultural thing, isn't it? Correct. And I'm very clear, you know, as a coach or somebody who's guiding or mentoring, mm. they have to do the hard work. Yes. You know, all I can do is give feedback, make observations, ask the tough questions, yes. you know, make a little nudge here or there, but ultimately they have to do the work. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So another question, Angela, I think we'll make this the last one. It's a fascinating topic. So if you were to go into a very rigidly hierarchical organization, let's just say the mafia pulled you in, the Italian <laughs> mafia pulled oh you goodness. in. <laughs> yeah. And they said, you know, yeah, we've got the capo and we've got the, you know, all the kind of soldiers, the foot soldiers and all the rest of it. What would you say to them in that particular instance? They said, yeah, we want to modernize. It's about time we bought in one of these frameworks. They're mm -hmm. listening to this interview and they're saying, I like the sound of that. You know, we can transform this organization into a real you know, powerhouse. So what would you do? Obviously, apart from you, well, I know you probably say no, because... <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> theoretically, obviously. <laughs> well, yeah, and you already provided the why, right? We want to modernize this organization. So yeah. what does that mean? What does modernize mean? What are you going to measure? What problem are you trying to solve? We need to get really into that first. But you mentioned hierarchical. And so one of the things I do ask, are you willing to change? Yes or no? Because sometimes people flat out say no. Then it becomes a circular conversation. So, oh, you know, I'll thank them for their honesty, yeah. but then this is not the framework for you. If you're not willing to change, then don't. But if they say yes, sometimes people get a little scared about how much change or, you know, black, white, bad, good. Those aren't helpful either. So great that you're willing to change. How much? 
let's start talking with how much change is too much change because this is all about incrementally improving. This is all about continuous improvement. So rather than big bang, we would start with what are the small wins and then evaluate that and then the next one and the next one and the next one. Because those slow boil change progressions tend to be lasting. The big bang ones scare everybody, right? Just scares everybody. And then they just revert right back to what they were doing. Yeah. And I suppose really people have to, they have to take on the, there has to be the kind of intelligent perspective really of this being for the greater good. And I guess I'm obviously I made a joke about the mafia, but you know, really when you think about an organization, it is an organization, right? But the thing about those very rigid hierarchies where somebody's at the top, then somebody is below and somebody's below them. And everybody kind of takes their little bit all the way up to the top. And then the guy at the top gets the most because he's just collecting the dues from everybody underneath him and all of that. And of course, they everybody is kept in place by threats and intimidation and fear. And, you know, they'll obviously get murdered if they do anything wrong and try and steal some of the money that should have been going up to the top and all of that kind of thing. And that very kind of, it's almost like an extreme example of a very fear-driven culture, isn't it? That fear, power, and so on. And I suppose really just to kind of conclude, what I've got from tonight is that this framework, this uh, scrum is really, it's a very intelligent um, way of empowering people and making them feel great about what they do so that they have more freedom. And I think more freedom to operate in an autonomous way, but that also benefits other people. So it really is kind of collaborative and kind of like an anti-power, anti-fear framework, I think. That's what I feel. And emotionally intelligent, you know, hence the people geek that I call myself. Because when, when people will say to me, what, what skills does a good scrum master need? Mm, I say, yeah. people skills. Oh, did I mention people skills? Mm, <laughs> because yeah. most of the things that we wind up picking up on have mm. nothing to do with specific, you know, work product or things like that. It has to do with identifying, oh, somebody's ego is involved in this. Oh, it really is a culture of fear. And if you're not emotionally intelligent and you don't have those people skills, it's really yeah. hard to pick up on that stuff. Yep, yep. And I guess what happens is in those, let's just call them toxic organizations, if the toxicity comes from the top, right? So if you have somebody Mm -hmm. who's not, who's emotionally unintelligent and really, let's just say, very power driven and really doesn't kind of respect people, then obviously what they're going to do is they're going to promote people who are like them into, into senior positions. And so then that kind of culture of toxicity to kind of takes hold a bit like, you know, some kind of a horrible weed or something. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be a very stark contrast between those intelligent organizations with smart people at the top who are true people leaders. And those are the people I think that your frameworks and your book is for. Absolutely. All about servant leadership, right? Raising everybody else up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been a totally fascinating conversation, Angela. Uh, I wasn't quite sure at the beginning. I didn't really know what this thing was. And I don't think, you know, some of our listeners will be in the same position. But I hope by now they understand the power of this really exciting business model, really. And I just wanted to thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And so if anybody wants to get hold of you, Angela, what's the very best way for them to do that? LinkedIn, put in Angela Johnson Scrum, Mm -hmm. and I pop right up because if you just put in Angela Johnson, like 32,000 names will come up. Okay. Or you can visit us at Mm scrumfiles.com and get a free download on how to get started with Scrum. Amazing. Amazing. I think I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm really interested now. So thank you. Okay. Well, see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Jane Bader is the Smart Connector, a London-based, passionate serial entrepreneur, brand marketer and business growth exploder. 
who helps overlooked and undervalued consultants and sector experts generate consistent, scalable revenues through becoming the go-to choice of their dream clients. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate you liking, rating and reviewing the podcast on the platform you've heard it on. And check out the links in the show notes if you'd like to connect with Jane or any of her guests in person. Thank you for listening and come back soon.